coverage of Interop is brought to you by HP Networking. Change the rules to enable the cloud. Also brought to you by Citrix and GoToMeeting. Go over to GoToMeeting.com, click the Try It Free Now button, and enter in the word podcast for a 30-day free trial. And also Telestream and Wirecast. Produce your show straight from your computer right to the internet with Wirecast. Geekazine is a proud member of the TechPodcast.com network. If it's tech, it's here. And very appropriately today, he's the uh, Chief Internet Evangelist and Vice President at Google. And Dan Lynch, uh, again, founder of Interop, somebody I think who actually brought entrepreneurism to the networking space. I mean, you're going to get a sense here this morning, Dan's uh, energy and uh, just livelihood and, and just how much enthusiasm he still has for the industry. So I'm really excited here now to introduce both Ben Surf and Dan Lynch for a, a conversation. Inside of every 60-year-old, there's a 16-year-old wondering what happened. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, well, actually, I have a couple of things I'd like to say before yeah. Dan gets into his interrogation. We're going we're to do an interrogation. Yeah, that's right. As this is on, on, on unclassified, but it should be classified. Yeah. Well, first of all, I want you to know something about Dan Lynch. In addition to having been the founder of Interop uh, and the first internet impresario, uh, he was very much instrumental in getting the internet to roll out. When he was uh, in his salad days, he was at a place called the USC Information Sciences Institute. He ran the computer center there. And during 1982, if you can think back that far, I know it sounds like the Civil War, uh, he was very concerned about whether we were actually getting the TCP IP protocols implemented in a timely way. So uh, he and his uh, colleagues at the, uh, uh, the computer center started testing to see which computers on the then ARPANET had actually implemented TCP IP protocols because we were scheduled to go live on all machines on the ARPANET on January 1st, 1983. So Dan was testing every single day to see how many machines were actually up and running. And we saw, we'd announced, I'd announced while I was at ARPA that we were going to do this rollout on January 1st. Everybody had to switch from the NCP protocols of the ARPANET to the TCP protocols of the internet. Um, and so we watched uh, the implementations go up. Remember, there were only 400 machines in the system at that time. We watched the implementations go up until about June, and then it flattened out. So I called the Defense Communications Agency, which was running uh, the ARPANET at the time. They said, shut off the NCP. You could do that. You could tell the imps not to run any protocol the TCP. And of course, I got phone calls, and you idiot, you screwed up the email, the file transfer, and what the hell do you think you're doing? I said, I just wanted you to know I can shut off the old protocols. So we watched the thing start to climb up again. Then it flattened out in October. So I called the DCA, and I said, shut it down for two days. Boy, more phone calls and screaming and yelling. We managed to get there in January 1, 1983, with only about two computers that weren't ready uh, to run the new internet protocols. The other thing, about Dan is that he believed that uh, you could not do anything unless you actually demonstrated it. That's what interop was about, was interoperability. So I brought a plaque, which comes from 1988, you know, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, which has a big piece of yellow Ethernet cable on it. This is a piece of the show net that was always run when Dan was running interop to show interoperability among all various uh, computer companies' equipment. And I thought, Dan, that you might like to keep this as a memento of the fabulous demonstration of what real engineering meant in the internet. Thank you very much. This, this cable, I mean, this was the cable that ran through the whole floor in the Santa Clara Convention Center in 1988. And, um, and, and then we wrapped up the cable at the end of the show and took it away and put it in my garage at the Cupertino. And, and then after a little while, I realized what I should do is get one of my sons to chop up the cable into little segments 
and then give a memento to everybody who was in the first, you know, interop net. And uh, so we did that, and uh, minus the blood, you know, because that's a pretty thick cable. Uh, and uh, and I gave a couple to Vint, and I guess you're giving me one of these back. So uh, thank you very much. Oh, it was called. My company was called then Advanced Computing Environments, and but it said the Interop 88 exhibition on it because um, a friend of mine who was Craig Partridge at BBN was one of the teachers uh, at some of the classes that were going on, and I was on the phone with him just a little in August, and he said to me, he says, "I'll see you at Interop," and I just went write that down, you know, and, and trademark that, and so that, that's how the name Interop came to be. Anyway. Um, so, you know, I, I met Vint about somewhere in the mid '70s. He was a professor at Stanford at the time, and um, and he was doing this crazy TCP stuff, okay, uh, with a bunch of people, and um, and that's how I met him. And um, and then he ran away from academia, I think, and went to uh, ARPA, went to the Defense Department, Defense, Defense, you know to run some programs for them, including what began the beginning of the internet. And, uh, and so, you know, that's when I met him. And, uh, and then a few years later, I ended up going to ISI, and down in LA, which you talked about, and, uh, and running their computers and all that. And, uh, and it was the largest node on the ARPANET at that time, all ARPANET, right? And, and I, I quickly found out that it was set up to uh, be a repository. It was cloud computing. Uh, and, and, and I had a half a dozen PDP-10s and a bunch of axes and PDP-11s and things like that. And we were, many computer scientists around the country that have government contracts use our facilities to do their, their research on. And, uh, and, and I uh, quickly found out that the major application was email. And, and that's what people really value. And so uh, towards the end, after a couple of years, I got the bright idea to start an email company, a commercial email company. And <laughs> uh, I remember this. OK, so I write this, what I thought was a business plan. And you, and, and I asked Vin, because Vin's a smart guy, you know, a really smart guy. And so, and by that time, you had moved over to MCI. That's right. This is and I late, asked, late 82. Late 82. And mm -hmm. I, I didn't know what he was doing there, because they were being secretive. And, uh, and so I asked Vin to read this little business plan I wrote to see, if, you know, to check it for anything, whatever he looked at. And I forget, you basically declined. I mean, when you found out the subject matter, he declined. That one bit of information was all I needed to know that MCI was going into the email. <laughs> okay, yeah, so much for security. <laughs> so much for security, right, exactly right. You know. And I, I abandoned my efforts because, I mean, I, I figured I didn't have the hundreds of millions that somebody like MCI, and then it turned out later Western Union came on, online with their you know, email system too. And they had spent about fifty to hundred million dollars to stand up these systems, and um, you know now, what? Um, I mean, how did that work out? That commercial email system for you? Well, to be honest, it was about <clears throat> ten or fifteen years ahead of its time. MCI Mail was a pretty remarkable uh, design because not only did it send email around in the conventional sense, but you could also uh, include postal addresses as part of your distribution list, and it would print the letters out, put them in bright uh, orange envelopes and mail them. You could even say you wanted them to go overnight. Uh, you could print your own letterhead. You could have your signature, uh, a facsimile of your signature on the uh, printed materials as well. So it was a very advanced system. It could interconnect with the telex system, right. uh, and eventually you could do faxes from it. Uh, the problem is that when it was released in September of 1983, that's even before the Macintosh shows up, right? The big 1984 announcement. People didn't have a whole lot of computer equipment. They had, if they had terminals at home at all, it was on dial-up modems. 
So the population, if you take advantage of that commercial system, is still relatively small. If we had gone into business in 1993, I think we would be better off because that's when people started apologizing for not having email addresses on their business cards. So it was technically a big success. And it played an interesting role in the commercialization of the internet. Uh, in addition to Interop, which illustrated uh, the fact that there was a real market for uh, internet-based equipment, uh, the idea that the commercial sector could actually make money out of offering services hadn't been established. And in 1988, at this, the show where this plaque comes from, I remember walking into the show floor of Interop with Eric Benema, who at the time was the CEO of Freecom. And as we walked in, I saw a two-story uh, display from Cisco Systems. It was huge. And <clears throat> this is 1988, only a couple of years after the company was founded. And I turned to Eric and I said, Eric, how much do those displays cost? And he said, well, a quarter of a million dollars. And then it's another quarter of a million to you know, keep it man, man for the period of the conference. I thought, my God, somebody thinks they're going to make money out of this internet stuff. So uh, I thought, well, we'll never get to the general public under the then uh, current rules of use of the internet because in 1988, only people with government contracts were allowed to use it. So uh, I went to the Federal Networking Council uh, at the time and I said, could I have permission to connect the MCI mail system to the internet because I designed and yeah. built both of those things. And uh, so I, I figured I could, could find a way to make that work. And much to my surprise, they said yes. And they gave us a year. To, uh, to do this. So in uh, 1989, during the summer, we actually announced the connection of MCI mail to the internet. That broke the policy logjam, and as soon as we announced that, um, we, uh, they, the Federal Mountain Council, got calls from Telemail, from On Time, from CompuServe, saying, wait a minute, those MCI guys can't have this special privileged position. Uh, we want to be connected to the internet, too. And the FNC said, you know, sure, have a shot. So they all got hooked up to the internet in 1989, and the side effect of that was that the email systems, which would be completely separate from each other, were then interconnected because they both, or they all of them, had to be uh, compatible with the internet addressing structure, the email addressing structure. There's a, a lesson in that story for you today with cloud computing, because today cloud computing is like the email of the 1980s. Things were not interconnected, you couldn't interchange things between email, you can't interchange things between clouds except as a, you know, a client type of download stuff from the cloud and push it out. That is going to change. There will be the same pressures to get cloud systems we are operating under some standard uh, conditions will happen in the same way that email ultimately got interconnected and of course networking ultimately got connected, supplanting a lot of proprietary networks that pre-existed the internet. Yeah, it will get done that way in cloud computing when you, the customers, get angry enough with the providers that are trying to lock you in. End of statement. Uh, why didn't you uh, put in security? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, that's a fair, fair question. Uh, two things. First of all, keep in mind that Bob Kahn and I wrote the first papers about the internet in 1973 and published them in 1974. At the time, all of the uh, typical cryptographic security mechanisms that were available were classified and generally in, in the hands of the National Security Agency. Uh, the public key crypto idea didn't get published until 1977 uh, when uh, Marty Hellman and Wick Diffie published their first papers. And unfortunately, 1977 was literally the year before the internet protocols that you're using today were standardized, IP, TCP IP version 4 was standardized in 1978 before any implementations of public key cryptography were available. So uh, we kind of missed that cycle, uh, on top of which uh, I had started work uh, while I was still at Stanford with the National Security Agency to design and build a secure internet. The problem is that all of the technology that was used to achieve that objective was classified. And I couldn't tell any of my colleagues at other universities or even at uh, Stanford. Uh, about what the design looked like and what things had to be done in order to secure it. So uh, we ended up, I was very schizophrenic because I was going in two different directions. So you ended up with a network that didn't have all the features that it could have had and can have. There's nothing stopping us from 
you know, utilizing the existing technology today, which is publicly available, to secure the internet more fully. And that's what DNSSEC is about. That's what RPKI is about. That's what HTTPS is about. That's what IPSec is about. All of these various things, in addition to better operating systems, there's much, much more suspicious browsers, uh, paranoid browsers that think that they may be invaded at any, any time, uh, will contribute to a much stronger, more secure internet. But sorry, I couldn't deliver that in 1974. Well, what are you going to deliver now? I mean, <laughs> well, actually, there's a, a network of things. This is a tough moderator. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Several things you're going to have to remember. I'm at Google now, so uh, if, yeah, if that's the king of the hill right now. Final, final wave of, uh, of uh, you know excited, uh, interested people. They're all running at 900 miles an hour because of PM. You know you can't do that. Uh, it's, it's wonderful. Actually, you know, I figure I, my my new metric for uh, the really good days of I've worn out two 26 year olds. I consider that to be a really good. Day. <laughs> uh, uh, Google is really uh, demonstrating that uh, Larry Page's point about being, uh, you know, aim high is a really good one. He said you won't you won't hit the target every time. But if you don't aim high, it's guaranteed that whatever target you hit will be lower than the one that you could have hit right. at aim high. So he said, if shoot for the moon, uh, it's OK to fail. And that, by the way, is a very important precedent to have. If it's OK to fail, you can take risk. If you don't take risk, you have only incremental changes. So what we're seeing today, especially in cloud computing, is a massive application of processing power to problems that uh, would normally have been totally intractable. Uh, even a few years ago. And I'm increasingly impressed. In fact, those of you who subscribe to Scientific American, please go get the latest issue of Big 7 on the front cover and look for the article about Bayes' theorem because Bayesian probabilistic theory has become an incredibly powerful force in the application of artificial intelligence and probability by new, uh, new applications. It's being used, for example, to do speech understanding, which has gotten very, very far uh, ahead now from where it was 20 years ago. Uh, although I suppose if you're on the other end of an automatic answering system that's trying to talk to you, you still have the feeling that it's not fully adequate. On the other hand, translations from one language to another are now very common. We do it in Gmail now. If a message comes to you in German and your preferred language is English, it will say, would you like me to translate from the German into the English? It's not always perfect, but it does give you a fair sense for, uh, for what's going on. Do you remember early social networking? Yes. I mean, pre-1980? Yes, absolutely. In fact, well, your point about email is an important one. Uh, Dan mentioned uh, the email, but didn't mention that it was invented in 1971 uh, by uh, an engineer named Ray Tomlinson and uh, Moore Baranek and Newman. To be accurate, he didn't invent email. That was already there with time sharing systems and people could leave files for each other. But what he did was to take that file process and make it work between computers over the internet. That was uh, network email. And within literally months of its uh, you know, uh, arrival, people started using distribution lists as a way of sharing information with groups. And the early groups that I remember were sci-fi lovers, people who loved to read science fiction. You know, there's a bunch of geeks who did all this work, so you didn't expect that. Uh, and, and the next thing that popped up that I think I remember is called Yum Yum, which is a distribution list at Stanford with restaurant reviews in the uh, Bay Area. So it was very apparent from the earliest days of email that it was the social networking medium, and we all made heavy use of that fact. I mean, I remember in 76 or so, there was a uh, TV show called Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, which was a nighttime soap. And, um, and, and there was a kid on my staff, Jeff Goodfellow, who started a, a list on a discussion list <clears throat> on Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, and and people were subscribing to it all over the country, and it was almost taking my machine down, <laughs> you know, and, and with the load. And I called your boss, Bob Kahn, okay, at ARPA, just tell him what the hell was going on. And he said, "This is great. We need the load to test the protocol." <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, we don't approve of the subject matter, but that's how you get loaded. You know, that's, that's a very interesting response because there was an earlier, or maybe during the same time period, uh, someone from Digital Equipment 
Corporation sent an email around. Gary Disarmish was listening. advertising the job, and the guy who's running the information processing techniques office at ARPA, where I work at that time, was an Army colonel, PhD in nuclear engineering, the Army colonel. And he, he was in London at the time, and that, that message showed up in London. I swear you heard the atomic blast all the way back <laughs> uh, in Washington, because this was not supposed to be used for anything except government research. Yeah, yeah, thank God for breaking the rules, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, I broke the rules, you know, at Interop all the time. I mean, I was doing commercial everything, and it wasn't supposed to be commercial, but we had some bullshit about, you know, this is just testing the protocols and things like that. And, you know, yeah. they gotta go. There's what? a government contract somewhere, you know, in the lurking, you know. Actually, I seem to recall writing uh, statements of work. And I've always included one statement of work, which I call the 18th Airborne Statement of Work. This is the one you would fly the 18th Airborne board through when nobody would notice. The whole idea was to give lots of latitude to people who were doing work on the internet to try things out. Yep. Now, I remember in 1992, I was at a meeting in Kobe and of the Internet Architecture Board. Yes. And we were already worried about running out of version four IP numbers, okay? And so we were just trying to figure out the next version of IP. And um, we came up with this idea that is now called IPv6. And I left that meeting a little early because I had to catch a flight back to the States. And I'm sure that we all agreed that that's what it was gonna be. IPv6, okay, the protocol and everything. And so I got, were you, were you there? Or were you still there? Uh, yes. Yes. And when I got back to the States, it had turned upside down, okay? The, the agreement that we had turned out to be not quite an agreement. And, and but now we do have agreement, right? I mean, so that, let me, let me yeah. explain and don't uh, clarify that was what happened. 19 years ago we agreed on this and now we're finally rolling it out. Actually, this is more complicated. This theorem number 208, there's 206, is everything is more complicated. Yeah. So, what actually happened is that the Internet Architecture Board decided that it needed to have a packet format that had more address space in it. Now, remember that the Open Systems Interconnection Protocols have yeah. been at war with TCP IP for, for a very long time. And uh, the proposal was, instead of spending several years designing a new IP format, why don't we just take the OSI format right. and use okay. that? Forget the rest of the protocols, just use the format. Right. Well, this uh, triggered, that was the agreement, that <coughs> triggered an explosion in the Internet Engineering Task Force. Four years went by of argumentation, multiple alternatives, until we finally decided ITNG was the phrase NG, we finally ended up winnowing you know, uh, from four down to one. So IT version six was standardized in 1996 and not much adopted until just about now. And here we are, we're out of the four address space, at least at the IANA level. On June 8th this year, uh, many of us, including Google, are going to turn on responsiveness to IPv6 protocols and DNS queries. Uh, so on a global basis, World IPv6 day <coughs> happens on June 8th. Those of you who are curious to find out whether your stuff works with V6, this would be a good opportunity to find out. If it doesn't work, please fix it, because that's the only way we're going to expand the internet, is to have that 128-bit address space available to everyone everywhere. Otherwise, we'll end up with cascading NAT boxes, and that is simply not architecturally sound. So there. So there, all right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when technologists get together, they almost agree and then someone finds a reason to disagree. Well, you know, I had to do, uh, in the minute or so remaining, the following meeting of the Internet Engineering Task Force, there was this big insurrection, how could you possibly consider using the OSI protocol format? Um, and so in order to uh, reassure everyone that, uh, that I was still very much in the Internet protocol camp, uh, I appeared at the IETF meeting in my regular three-piece suit and proceeded to strip down to my t-shirt, which read, IP on everything. <laughs> <laughs> That's true.
There's a video floating around somewhere. I remember one guy at Ski Knowles ran up and stuffed a five dollar bill in my waist waistband. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what better place in Vegas to reveal this now? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Vin. Thank you very much for uh, subjecting yourself to uh, some questioning. And uh, and I hope uh, the last time Vin and I did this was uh, over at the Hilton, and um, it was called a fireside chat. And about five or ten minutes into the talk. The fire alarm went off. That's right. Oh my God, we all evacuated. And it could not be turned off, and it could not be turned off. And, uh, and so Vince and I got up on the stage and in the Macarena for a few minutes, because we figured you guys are here to be entertained, mostly. You know. But, uh, well, we only have 16 seconds left. Yeah, Why don't we thank everybody for their interest in interop, for right. their interest in internet. Keep going, folks. This is going to go on for the rest of the century. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Adios. of Interop is brought to you by HP Networking. Change the rules to enable the cloud. Also brought to you by Citrix and GoToMeeting. Go over to GoToMeeting.com, click the Try It Free Now button, and enter in the word podcast for a 30-day free trial. And also Telestream and Wirecast. Produce your show straight from your computer right to the internet with Wirecast. Geekazine is a proud member of the TechPodcast.com network. If it's tech, it's here.